Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. Well, the furor over The Chosen seems to have died down a little bit, but you've asked us what we think about it, and tonight we're going to let you know. Well, that is, we're going to let you know how it stacks up to Scripture, because that's really all that matters, not our personal opinions. Exactly right. And if you have no idea what Michelle is talking about, let me bring you up to speed. If you're familiar with the original content TV series Netflix creates and streams, well, The Chosen is a series just like that. It's a multi-episode series focused on the ministry years of Christ, only it's not on Netflix. It's on a streaming service called VidAngel. Now, season one premiered last year with eight episodes, and as we're recording this right now, seven of season two's eight episodes have now premiered, and it has caused quite a stir on social media. Yeah, it really has. So, what we want to do with with uh, these episodes, we're actually going to have two episodes, part one and part two, and tonight's going to be part one. What we want to talk about um, are two aspects of the series, The Chosen. We want to talk about the actual content of the episodes and how the stories compare to scripture. And we also want to talk about some of the theological issues with the people behind the scenes, like Dallas Jenkins, who's the creator and director of The Chosen. So if you don't like spoilers, you should probably stop listening and and just save these episodes until you finish season season two of the chosen. And tonight we're really going to start by tackling the some of the behind the scenes and production uh, issues and and things that have happened with the chosen. Yeah, and in addition to warning about spoilers, we also want to address the question of whether or not Christians should watch The Chosen, because that seems to be the question on the minds of a lot of you who had, haven't seen it yet. So here's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, Michelle and I are absolutely not endorsing The Chosen or recommending that you should definitely watch it like we would endorse and recommend, for example, the American Gospel movies. Those are great, but we're not warning you away from it either, like we would warn you away from the movie The Shack. What we are doing is presenting you with some information that you can consider, pray about, and uh, use to make a wise, godly decision for yourself about whether or not you should watch The Chosen, because that's really what discernment is all about. That's right. And a second thing to keep in mind is this. As with any Bible-y sort of movie, you've got to hold the chosen at arm's length with the thought constantly in your mind, this is not the Bible. This is a TV show. Whatever you see in this series might be a reasonable imagining of how a biblical event happened or how a biblical character acted, or it might have happened in a totally different way. So don't take what you see in the chosen as gospel. Um, but something I've been very concerned about, um, as I've read and heard viewers' responses to The Chosen, is repeated remarks like, I came to know Jesus better through this show. But unless the person who's saying that means that the show inspired her to pick up her Bible and study it, and that's how she came to know Jesus better, this is a really very dangerous statement. The Bible is clear that we come to the knowledge of Christ and his word through scripture, and the chosen is not scripture. It is not breathed out by the Holy Spirit. It is not infallible. It is not inerrant. And the actor portraying Jesus in the show is not Jesus. You cannot get to know Jesus better through the chosen because the person you're seeing on the show isn't Jesus. We must never derive our doctrine or practices from any source except the Bible. Yeah, and in addition to remembering that The Chosen isn't the Bible, The Chosen also isn't a Bible study. It is a work of historical fiction. It's entertainment. So while we certainly don't abandon all biblical standards for a piece of entertainment, those standards aren't the same as our standards for a Bible study. Obviously, our standards for a Bible study should be much higher than our standards for a TV show. 
And finally, you'll want to consider whether or not you believe portrayals of Jesus violate the second commandment against making graven images. Now, some Christians believe that any portrayal of Jesus breaks the second commandment. Things like nativity scenes, uh, pictures of Jesus in children's Bibles, actors portraying Jesus in movies and plays and so on. And Michelle and I disagree with that view since the context of the second commandment clearly intends to prohibit the making of graven images for the purpose of worshiping them. We don't have time to go into that issue in depth tonight, but Michelle has a blog article that explains the details, and we're going to link that up in the show notes. That's right. So please give all of those things some thought and prayer and use godly wisdom about whether or not you should watch The Chosen. If your conscience bothers you about it or something just doesn't feel right about watching it, then by all means, don't watch it. You should never go against your conscience. That's just not a good good thing to do. So I mentioned that we're going to talk about the content of the show itself and also the issues with Dallas Jenkins and the people who made the show. So for show prep, I had the cushy job of watching The Chosen, and Amy did the heavy lifting of researching the issues with the people behind the scenes. So Amy, why don't you get us kicked off and tell us what you learned about Dallas Jenkins and the rest of The Chosen crew? You bet. And uh, by the way, I think I had the cushier job. (laughs) I I did watch (laughs) season one last year with the intention of doing a biblical review myself, but I decided halfway through not to review it when I saw that you were reviewing it, Michelle, and uh, (laughs) knowing, of course, that you would do a very thorough job. So uh, thank you for that. It was a great review. Um, I has have, uh, as of now, not seen any of the second season yet. Uh, maybe I will by the time we record our second podcast episode. I, I think I probably should. But anyhow, uh, when the first episodes of season one started rolling out, you know, we really didn't know much about who The Chosen's writer slash director Dallas Jenkins really is or his beliefs. We knew he was the son of Jerry B. Jenkins, uh, who is uh, the co-author of the Left Behind series. But Dallas, the son, is uh, the former director of visual media and member of the executive leadership team at Harvest Bible Chapel. Uh, That's James McDonald's former church. You may remember uh, him. Um, And that church has a long reputation for adhering to a biblical statement of faith. Uh, But Dallas was one of the leaders of the HBC who attempted to uh, bring about a biblical solution to that whole uh, McDonald debacle several years ago. And uh, if if that's all new to you, We're going to link that up in the show notes if you're not familiar. Okay, the first hint that something didn't quite sit right with many people, including myself, uh, was Dallas's own admission during season one director interviews that he had that he got the idea for this film from God himself. He said in an interview uh, with our friend Melissa Doherty, quote, I felt like God was saying that this will be the definitive portrayal of my people, and this is what people are going to think of around the world when they think of my people, and I'm not going to let you screw it up, end quote. Now, Oh boy, Michelle, this doesn't sound at all like any Bible verses in which God actually speaks in Scripture. It sounds, to me, anyway, more like something of a Jesus calling God or a Beth Moore direct revelation God, uh, something like those gods with little g's would say, because uh, you know those aren't real depictions of God either. But be that as it may, uh, ladies, the canon of Scripture is closed, and God has already spoken, right? His word is sufficient, or it ought to be. There is no authority in the words that Dallas Jenkins is attributing to God, uh, such as in, uh, thus saith the Lord. Okay, then, last summer, uh, Dallas did his first interview on a Mormon YouTube channel that raised eyebrows. And it certainly will. Uh, It's not that he did this to share Jesus with those who are in the false belief system of the Latter-day Saints movement, but to affirm that the systems of Mormonism and Roman Catholicism are both biblical Christianity, which they they are not. Uh, We'll put some links on our show notes so you can compare the two. But ever since that interview, Dallas has doubled down and has revealed that he partnered with Roman Catholic and Mormon leaders to produce 
produce these episodes. He really does believe that we all worship the same God. Now, just so that you can hear his own voice say these things, I have a soundbite here that I'd like to play. Uh, See what you think, Michelle. This is Dallas Jenkins being interviewed by a Mormon named David Snell on his Saints Unscripted YouTube channel titled Interview with a Mormon and an Evangelical. Let's take a listen. Will the audience be bothered by the fact that there are um, LDS people involved? Even if I had significant disagreements with the LDS community, which I've learned I have fewer than I thought I did. But even with that, I was okay. I was comfortable with that because as long as they're treating the show properly, that's all that matters. So it's been, I, I can honestly say it's been one of the top three most fascinating and beautiful things about this project has been my growing brother and sisterhood with people of the LDS community that I never would have known otherwise and learning so much about um, about your, your faith tradition um, and realizing, gosh, for all the stuff that maybe we don't see eye to eye on, that all happened, that's all based on stuff that happened after Jesus was here. Um, the stories of Jesus we do agree on and we we love the same jesus um that's not something that you often hear sometimes it's like oh you uh, they that's believe a, in a different yeah, jesus than we do statement yeah no it's the same i mean i'll 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 sink or swim on that statement and i and it's controversial and i um i don't mind getting criticized at all for the show and i don't mind being called a blasphemer i don't like it when my friends are and um i've made it very clear that um, if I go down, if I go down, I'm going down swinging, protecting my friends and my my brothers and sisters. And so, I don't deny we have a lot of theological differences, but we we love the same Jesus. Okay, Michelle, uh, he he plainly said it. He doubled down. What do you think? Wow, I uh, I am just uh, slack jawed at that. I mean, I can't. I, you know, my my initial reaction is to try and extend some grace and the benefit of the doubt and just say he must not know enough about Mormonism to fit on a gum wrapper because anybody who does knows that Mormons and Christians do not love the same Jesus. They, the thing is, Mormons say they love the Jesus of the Bible and they use all the same kind of Christian terminology that we do, but they define it differently. And if right. you have ever um, studied anything about Mormonism and what they think about Jesus, I mean, they, they think Jesus and Lucifer were were brothers, were spirit brothers or something like that. And I mean, that right there, just that one fact enough, alone is enough to, uh, to help you know that they don't define Jesus the same way the Bible defines Jesus. So the only thing I can possibly think putting the best possible construction on this is that he doesn't know anything anything about Mormonism. He just hears what Mormons have to say, and he believes whatever they say, and he's fooled by the Christianese terminology that they use, but that they define a different way. So uh, that's really all, that's all I can think. <laughs> right. And and why he would invite somebody from a, a very different uh, worldview, very different religion, very you know, not Christian, uh, to help produce this movie uh, or these series. I I just don't understand. I mean, it's one thing to use you know products and services of a non Christian company. Quite another matter, though, personally, uh, to believe as a Christian that false religions are Christianity and that adherents of those religions are brothers and sisters in Christ. The, folks, this is called religious syncretism, the blending of a false religion with biblical Christianity. It must not be done. It's kind of like a few years back, you might have heard of the word Chrislam, the blending of Christianity with Islam. Oh, yeah, that's a real thing, too. Um, this kind of syncretism, though, happens all the time. And it's growing worse and worse as those in the visible church are embracing it, uh, like we're seeing here with the chosen. If these revelations of Dallas's uh, beliefs prevent you from watching this chosen, uh, I can certainly understand that. And I would encourage you not to sin against your conscience by watching it. For me personally, it is 
is something I won't recommend for even for entertainment for that reason. Um, one thing to note is that this series has spawned a lot of products, merchandise that you can purchase, including an accompanying devotional to the movie titled The Chosen, 40 Days with Jesus. Uh, why is it always 40 days? I don't know. 40 it must be significant. <laughs> um, ladies, this is not a Bible study. Bible study is reading and studying this text of the Bible. It's a, This is a devotional. Michelle, you got a sneak peek at the, the first few devotionals. I haven't seen them. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I had just had the opportunity to look at that on, um, you know, when you go to Amazon and look at a book, a lot of times you can uh, click on the look inside button and it'll show you the first several pages of the book. And so I had just read through that and, uh, you know, it, it's okay. It was okay. It wasn't, um, it wasn't, you know, anything earth shattering or anything like that. It didn't say anything really deep. Um, nothing really profound, you know, it's, it's kind of, it was kind of like, this is how I describe it. It's kind of like having a Hershey's kiss for a mid afternoon snack. You know, it's, it's quick and it's sweet and it's enjoyable for a few seconds, but it's, it's not sitting down at the table and eating a substantive, well-balanced meal of Bible study. But, you know, for a Hershey's kiss, it's not bad. It's not, you know, nothing jumps out and slaps you in the face as heretical. You know, it uses scripture and the Bible characters in the show to point the reader to Christ. The first three entries lean really heavily on Mary Magdalene, and I assume that's because she is the the very first character that's introduced in The Chosen. So, you know, for yeah. what I saw on Amazon, it was it was okay. It wasn't too bad, but it's, you know, not something I'm going to recommend that people use. I, of course, I always recommend that women study straight from the text of scripture, so I'm not going to recommend it I. anyway. Yeah, but but if I were going to recommend a devotional for you to use, I wouldn't recommend that one. Yeah. And you know, if any of you ladies have actually uh, read that devotional or, or you can get your hands on one, let us know because I just have this this bad feeling that this Hershey's Kiss is actually kind of a chocolate covered coating for poison. So um, I, I could be wrong, but uh, I, I would love to hear from somebody who's uh, maybe studied the whole thing. Um, yeah. Another product that's come out of this is a new book by Dallas's father, Jerry B. Jenkins, who we mentioned earlier, the author of the Left Behind series. Oh, yeah, he jumped right in there. It's titled The Chosen Novel Book One, I Have Called You by Name, based on season one of The Chosen. Now, I want you, and we're going to link this up, too, in the show notes, and I want you to notice something from this book's official publisher website. Here's the quote. It says, the official novel based on season one of the immensely popular TV series, which has been seen in every country in the world with over 85 million views, the latest fiction from Jerry Jenkins, perhaps the best-selling Christian novelist of recent times. End quote. Okay. Notice that even his publisher calls this fiction, but 85 million people around the world, you, you got to ask this question, will his readers get that this is not the real Jesus? I don't think all of them, because the reviews on that page, they're right front and center. You can read them. They're all from readers who are all saying, you know, just how much they've learned about the real Jesus from the fiction series and the fiction book. And many of those who are being challenged uh, on social media about the religious syncretism are saying, well, so what? God can use anything to open their eyes to him. And I would just say that this whole God can use anything argument is often used when contending for the faith against false religions like New Age, Word of Faith, or the New Apostolic Reformation and more. I want to make something really clear. God uses the gospel to open eyes and he Amen. uses circumstances like our you know death in the family or grief or pain or illness um, other losses to get our attention providentially does he use fiction influenced by false religions to save people ask yourself that question and and consider some bible verses i want to read uh, romans 3 8 why not say as some slanderously claim that we say let us do evil that good may result their condemnation is just. John fourteen six says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
And 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's right. And and one more, and I can never remember the reference for this one, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes. So, you know, that's that just says it right there. Well, you know, Amy, except for the, the purpose of creating more merch to sell, I just don't get why this novel would even be written. I mean, yeah. why would you not say, hey, did you like The Chosen? Well, you're going to love the Bible. It's 100% true, and it's powered by the Holy Spirit. Get one wherever Bibles are sold, you know, something like that. If their desire is truly to point people to Christ, which is what Dallas and everybody else at The Chosen claims, that's exactly what they would do. They would use The Chosen as a springboard to point people back to the scriptures. That's what they would do, but they don't. Right. (laughs) And you know what else, Michelle? In addition to the devotional and this novel we talked about, they've also put out an actual Bible study, actual Bible study, yep, that's meant to accompany this show. Now, the devotional and this Bible study I'm talking about list Amanda Jenkins, and that's Dallas's wife, as the primary author in addition to uh, several others. Listen to what the preface of this so-called Bible study says on page seven. Quote, We're guessing this Bible study will be unlike others you've encountered. Most studies that include video content are lecture-based with teaching centered on a specific topic or portion of Scripture. This Bible study, however, is designed to be used in conjunction with The Chosen. Each session works in tandem with an episode from the show. Oh, boy. I mean, this means basically you're going to use episodes of The Chosen in place of your Bible, or at the very least, as your main study material in addition to your Bible. Uh, It's just nuts. I mean, later in the preface, (laughs) they instruct you to watch the episode of The Chosen that corresponds to the lesson before going through the lesson material. Huh. That's right. And and Amy, I can hear how you're fixing to lose your mind Sorry. over this. And I, I was really fixing Grief. to lose my mind yeah. over it, too. No, but that's good. I wanted to say that that's good because just like we were talking about a few minutes ago, I mentioned that we have higher standards for Bible studies than we do for a TV show. So where, where we might... Um, I don't want to say let things slide with the TV show, We not let things slide, but maybe extend a little more grace with the TV show itself. We're, we need to come down on this so-called Bible study because it has some problems. And all I was able to read, again, was the, the sample that was available on Amazon. And that was just the preface and the introduction and the part of the first yeah. lesson. Um. So you were talking about the preface, and after the preface, there's a section called Meet the Mains, the main characters, and they give a little biographical blurb on some of the main characters in the show, Mary Magdalene, Nicodemus, Matthew, and Simon Peter. Now, in fairness, these little character bios seem to be generally biblically correct, and they are based on scripture, but part of the one about Mary Magdalene just pushed my buttons. Talk about losing your mind. Listen to this. This is a quote from from the bio on Mary Magdalene in the uh, Chosen's Bible study book. Here's what it says. It says, in a culture that viewed women as less valuable than men, Mary became a significant member of the team. And then it goes on to say some things that were based on scripture. It says she was among the female disciples who traveled with Jesus and financially supported his ministry, Luke 8, 1 through 3. That's true enough. She was present at his crucifixion and burial, Matthew 27, 56 through 61. That's also true. She was the first to witness the empty tomb, John 20, verse 1, and meet the resurrected Jesus. And then they give the gospel citations for that. And then listen to this line. And she got to tell the boys. That's how it ends. What? Uh, she did, did she? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, okay. It's certainly true enough that women were viewed as less valuable than men in that culture in that time. And, I, you know, you and I have both talked about that before, Michelle. But a valuable member of the team, uh, that's misleading. The team, if you have to call it that, what were the 12 
apostles, and Mary wasn't one of them. And we're going to talk about more, you know, more on that later. I need to calm down. I need right. to breathe a little bit more here. <laughs> yes, I think we're we're both going to have to. Mary Magdalene is a very uh, polarizing uh, character in this show for uh, for for us. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, that's that is misleading. And then this this she got to tell the boys bit. Wow, I mean, the disciples were not boys; they were men. So that's emasculating. And to me, this just sounds like some bratty little seven-year-old girl on the playground sticking out her tongue at the the biblical role of women and going, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, she got to tell the boys. Anything boys can do, girls can do better. Girls rule and boys drool. You know, that's how it comes off to me. Maybe they didn't intend it that way, but that's how it comes across to me. It, It really does. And by the way, it's really interesting how Mary Magdalene is so often first or center stage here. Uh, She's the first character we meet in the very first episode of the show. And that first episode is largely about her. She's the first character in the devotional too. And she's the first character introduced in that Bible study. You know, like Michelle said, we're going to talk more about that later. Right. So they introduce these main characters and then they go into the introduction section of the book which sort of explains the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, because they're going to be, for some reason I I don't fully understand, they're going to be drawing largely on Isaiah a lot in this study. I didn't get to the part where they really make that connection clear, but uh, anyway, they're going to be drawing on Isaiah a lot in the study. And they basically treat the introduction as one of the lessons in the study. You know, there are questions to answer. And of course, most of them are all about you. Like, in what ways are you like Isaiah? In what ways are you not like Isaiah? What thoughts and feelings does the phrase God's plan evoke in you? Um, But as problematic as making a Bible study all about you is, there's a much bigger problem in the introduction, and that is the muddling of the gospel. Um, You can tell by the way the book is written that the target audience for this book is is lost people or maybe people who've been who've been saved like five minutes and have never set foot in a church or cracked open a Bible. And that's totally fine if that's going to be your audience. But If that is your audience, you'd better make the gospel in your face, crystal clear and unmistakable. And this book, at least in the introduction, does not. So they're going, yeah, they're going along explaining the gist of the Old Testament. And so they they explain the cycle of sin that we see over and over again with the Israelites. And I'm sure all of us who have read the Old Testament are very familiar with, you know, Everybody, every, Israel's going along and everybody's obeying God and things are going great. And then all of a sudden, or over a period of years, they plunge into sin. And then God disciplines them by sending some calamity to draw them back to himself. And they cry out to God in repentance. And then he delivers them. And then they start living in obedience to him again until they start sinning again and just over and over and over like that. So they say in the book, this is exactly what happens in our individual lives. And on page 21, there's a little diagram called the sin cycle. And here are the steps in the sin cycle. And it's kind of arranged in a circle. So it just keeps going around and around. But the, the, first, the first step at the top in the sin cycle says, God's plan is good and awesome and loving and for our good and his glory. Okay, mm-hmm. that's good. Then we deviate from God's plan by sinning and going our own way. True enough. Next, The next step says we need to be rescued from sin and the consequences of our own bad choices. Okay, that's great too. Next, we repent from our sin and God is willing, able, and faithful to forgive us and rescue us. After that, we receive forgiveness and our relationship with God is restored. We renew our commitment to surrender to God's plan. Now, Amy, so far that sounds like the gospel, right? I mean, it's a really basic plan of salvation and the wording isn't too great in spots and it needs to be beefed up with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. But generally speaking, it's correct, right? Yeah, yeah it is. Right so there. the diagram ends with one last step that I haven't read yet. Amy, what do you think comes after we receive forgiveness and our relationship with God is restored? We renew our commitment to surrender to God's plan. 
Uh, I'm hoping that it has to do with explaining the sanctification process, being molded into the image of Christ by the Holy Spirit, right? That's what it says next. Yeah, you would think that would be what it says, but you would think it would say something like, we follow Christ for the rest of our lives until we die and he takes us to heaven. But it doesn't say that. The last step in this diagram is we sin and go our own way again, which makes it sound like You get saved, but then you're just as hopelessly lost in your sin as you were before. Now, this little sin cycle diagram is either supposed to be the gospel or it is not supposed to be the gospel. If it is supposed to be the gospel, the plan of salvation, then continuing in Israel-like cycles of rebellion against God is not the last step. That kind of fruit indicates that you're still lost if that's how you're living. The last step is like Amy and I said, sanctification, walking faithfully, albeit imperfectly. I mean, we still sin, but, but walking faithfully in general with God for the remainder of our lives. Exactly. Uh, They are referring to Isaiah a lot. And that language, we sin and go our own way, that's really close to Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But you know, that verse is really talking about lost people, not saved people, not Christians. So if this is supposed to be the gospel, then that last step is wrong. Absolutely. And if this is not supposed to be the gospel, and it's they're trying to convey how we continually sin as lost people, then they need to seriously revamp this thing. S- listen, step four, we repent from our sin and God is willing, able, and faithful to forgive us and rescue us. Step five, we receive forgiveness and our relationship with God is restored. We renew our commitment to surrender to God's plan. No, I mean, that's salvific language. If you're still lost and in this, in this constant cycle of repeated sin and rebellion, you haven't repented. You may have demonstrated what Second Corinthians 7.10 calls worldly grief, like being sorry you got caught in a sin or even sorry that that your sin hurt somebody. But that's not biblical repentance. And God is not, as this diagram says, quote, willing to forgive and rescue you. You do not receive forgiveness for that kind of worldly grief. Your relationship with God is not restored and you are not able, as 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, to renew any sort of real biblical commitment to surrender to God's plan. Yeah, that reminds me of a great meme I saw this morning. Repentance is not when you cry, it's when you change. So you know, it's a good point there, not that you need to clean up your life before you're saved, uh, but when you are granted by God the ability to repent for your of your sins, you actually turn away from sinning. Um, but I'm guessing the chosen Bible study and the sin cycle don't really go into all that, do they? No, they never clear this up, at, not at least in that same chapter where they're talking about this sin cycle where they should have cleared it up. I mean, a page or two later, they give this this mushy, gushy language of Jesus is your hope that your sin cycle can be broken and that the world isn't all there is or this world isn't all there is and that Jesus will change you from the inside out and yada, yada, yada. But they never tell you in any clear way how to get all of that, how to access all of that, how to be born again into all of that. And as much trouble as they take to explain and define terms like Pharisee and Sadducee, There's no clear explanation of repentance and faith. There's no cross, no atonement, no burial, no resurrection, no being made a new creature in Christ. Now, maybe they clearly all explain all of that later on in the book, but my goodness, if your target audience is lost people, shouldn't you explain that right up front in case they don't make it to the part of the book where you clarify all that? You would certainly think so. What a prime opportunity to reach the lost with the truth of the gospel's saving message. You know, God's word goes forth and changes lives. It does not come back void, but counterfeits do. 
That's well, that's going to wrap it up for part one of our two-part series on The Chosen. Next time, we're going to mostly delve into the actual content of the episodes and see how they stack up to Scripture. I'll be watching season two to catch up here, and, and we'll see if Michelle and I are noticing the same red flags. Be sure to check out the show notes on our website, a wordfitlyspoken.life, for even more helpful information. And if you enjoy A Word Fitly Spoken, don't forget to tell your friends about us and share our episodes around on social media. And we don't often remember to mention this, but we would also love it if you'd leave us a, a five-star rating or some kind of positive review on your favorite podcast platform. We do read your reviews and we really appreciate them. Plus, those reviews and ratings help put us on the radar of people who need solid biblical teaching. That's right. We definitely appreciate those ratings and reviews. And until next time, remember, if you're in Christ, you were chosen in Him before the foundations of the world. So walk worthy. 